denormalization and what has been an attractor for the two dimensional sympathetic dynamical systems. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Um I would like to thank the uh, organizers. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, can I ask you to turn? Yeah, thank you. So I, I gotta apologize. Um, I'll talk about renormalization of critical circle maps again. You will see a lot of the same things as uh, in uh, Misha's lecture, um, but I'll talk about it longer, even longer. There is there is some philosophical points that I have to make. Um, so we'll have to spend even more time on um, the subject, which I'm sure is familiar to many of you. Okay, so anyhow, so um, let me review a little bit the main definitions of renormalization of critical circle maps. So first of all, uh, the circle, I'll typically I, and sometimes it might be convenient for me to talk about the unit circle, but I'll typically, the circle for me will be the uh, quotient, R mod Z, the affine manifold. And I'll say that F is a critical circle map if it's a homeomorphism, orientation preserving, smooth, um, uh, usually at least C3, um, has a single critical point which the fixed ideas I'll always put at the origin, which is of the cubic type. Now, um, for those who know, um, all of these conditions except the homeomorphism part can be weakened, and most of this theory will go through with uh, some complications. Um, C3 can be weakened to 2 plus, plus epsilon. Single critical point could be replaced with multiple critical points, finitely many. Cubic type, well, we really just need them to be non-flat. So they, since this is a homeomorphism, they'll be of an odd order, but the order itself um, doesn't have to be 3. Anyway, so this is what I'll um, concentrate on. And there is everyone's favorite example, which is obtained by considering the Arnold's family. This is a one parameter family, x plus theta minus one over two pi sine two pi x. These maps um, are homeomorphisms of the real line, analytic, um, and they have cubic critical points at the integers. And also, they commute with the unit translation, and therefore, each one projects to a well-defined map of the circle, which is, by definition, a critical circle map. Now, uh, it might be worthwhile to remind you how the rotation number in such a family, which depends on theta in a strictly monotone fashion, right? If you look here, the dt theta here is 1. Um, how the rotation number depends on theta? Well, if you plot the graph, you get a devil's staircase. At rational heights, you will get intervals. This is typically called the mode locking intervals. This is, these are the intervals in which you have the periodic orbit with the specified combinatorial rotation number. And at irrational heights, you have single points. OK, now, renormalization. Well, uh, let me let me make a meta definition. Okay, so this is what renormalization is. This is a v-scale first return map. This is the meta definition of renormalization and dynamics, and I just have to tell you where we consider the first return on which uh, part of the circle and uh, how we rescale. So 
in fact, uh, the choice of the of the subset of the circle and on which on which I consider the first return map is really completely irrelevant as long as you do it consistently. For purely historical reasons, the following choice is made. Uh, there is a dynamically marked point uh, on the circle, which is your critical point zero. Now, if you look at your rotation number, let's, for simplicity for the moment, assume that it's irrational. You can expand it in an infinite continued fraction with positive terms, since it's rational, such a thing uh, would be specified uniquely. And um, consider the rational convergence, Pn over Qn, the rationals which are obtained by truncating this at a finite level. I'll abbreviate all of my continued fractions like this, write them, write them horizontally rather than vertically to save space. Right, so then denominators Qn, as everybody knows, are in particular the closest return times of any point of the circle. They are, by the way, not the only closest return times, but they are in particular the closest return times, which means that if I take my point zero and I consider, say, the f Qn iterate of zero, then between here there is no smaller iterate. The next closest return, f2 n plus 1, is on the other side of 0, and they keep on alternating. f2 n plus 2 will be here, and so on. Now, like I said, for historical reasons, when you consider the first return maps, you take the first return map between the two, um, two consecutive first returns given by f2 n of 0 and f2 n plus 1 of 0. So this interval around the origin. It is an elementary exercise that the first return here, the first return map here is defined piecewise. And on what I uh, denoted red, on the interval from f to n of 0 to 0, it's given by the iterate f to n plus 1, which shifts 0 over like this. I mean, all of these iterates are homeomorphisms, right? So if you've never dealt with uh, critical circle maps before, just think rotations, right? Which in this picture will look like translations. And then on the blue, which is to the right, it's given by the iterate FQN, which, is, which translates it over like that, and this point is the same. It's FQN plus QN plus 1 of 0. So that's a first return map, right? So I already told you what the first return map is. That's going to become my nth renormalization. I just have to tell you how to rescale. Now, we know what we want to rescale this to, right? We want to rescale this back to the circle. And it's not very hard to do. Here, let me draw a little caricature. This is my zero, FQM of zero, FQM plus one of zero. And I have my first return map of this interval. And I just need to um, get a new circle out of this. Because ultimately, I'm after an operator defined on critical circle maps. That's not very hard to do. You just use the blue map here. Do I have the blue? No, I don't. OK, so I'll use the green here. You use the green as your little local chart to glue the whole big interval into a circle. And then it's an elementary exercise that this pair of maps will project a well-defined map of the circle. Now, unfortunately, this construction has, has a built-in difficulty. And while the difficulty sounds technical, understanding it is important for what follows. And the difficulty is the following. What is our circle? It's the uh, fine manifold, T mod Z. When I glue by the iterant F to M, the smoothness of the gluing is the same as the smoothness of the map F. 
So at best, it's analytic if my map f is analytic, but it certainly wouldn't be affine. So once you um, cut out this interval, you lost the canonical affine structure. And uh, this construction doesn't allow you to recover it. So what you've recovered instead is the full one. Well, if my f is only C3, then you recover the smooth manifold of class C3, which is homeomorphic to a circle. You will have a well-defined first return map on this, well, map on this manifold, but there are infinitely many ways to identify this with T mod Z. So instead of recovering the map, I recover the smooth conjugacy class of maps. And that is the problem. Right. So uh, there is a classical solution to this problem, which uh, is not to glue. Right. So it means we considerably enlarge the space that we look at. Instead of looking at the space of circle maps, we now look at the space of pairs of interval maps. The classical definition um, calls this uh, commuting pairs. So I denote them by letters eta and psi. This seems to be established in the literature. Um, they basically behave in the exact same way as my two iterates, fqn and fqn plus 1. So my uh, point 0 is moved by eta to the um, right um, boundary point, and my point 0 is, is moved by psi to the left boundary point, and so on. And incidentally, I just noticed that I interchanged the sides of the blue and the red, but I hope you'll forgive me. The colors still mean the same. Now, I want this to be C3 homeomorphisms. I, I want them to be defined on slightly larger intervals and some neighborhoods, open neighborhoods of these two intervals so that I can say that zero is a cubic critical point for both of these. And there is one more condition. I want them to commute where computation is defined and, okay, look, uh, I want this just because, for obvious reasons, just because I don't want to worry uh, about taking compositions, right, since we do want to get a dynamical system out of this. But I would like to point out that if I'm working in the class C3, this is a rather weak condition. I mean, the domains of definition of these two maps intersect at a single point, at zero. Right, so what I'm really asking for is that these smooth homeomorphisms have C3 extensions to slightly larger intervals which commute at zero. So that's rather mild condition. It imposes finitely many conditions on the first few Taylor coefficients of these maps at two points. Okay, so now minimization is very easy to define. Remember, this thing still gives you a circle map. It's just not uniquely defined, right? Defined up to a conjugacy. So what, what we're really going to be doing is the exact same thing we would do with the critical circle map, right? If this were fqn, fqn plus 1, then we renormalize it to fqn plus 1, fqn plus 2. So I keep one of these maps. That's my map psi, and I replace the other one by the map which I get if I consider the next closest return of zero. Well, we all know uh, the formula qn plus 2 is equal to qn plus an plus 1, qn plus 1. Right? So hence the recipe, you iterate zero out by eta, and then you iterate it by psi as many times as you can until you run out of space on this side. Right? This number of times is exactly your number a m plus 1 in the continued fraction. And you get yourself a new pair, which is the original map psi on one side, and then the map psi, uh, sorry, eta composed of psi iterated r times, well, r is this corresponding digit in the continued fraction. Finally, 
all I need to do is rescale. And these are interval maps, so rescaling is very easy. I just normalize the size of the interval somehow. Traditionally, you normalize it by asking that the bigger of the two intervals is 0, 1, which is really why I put the red interval on the right here, because I wanted this point to be 1. Okay, so you rescale, make this 0, 1, the other interval falls, the other endpoints falls where it may, and you get yourself a renormalization. Okay, so I'm not, I mean, there are there, uh, lots and lots um, of papers on this going back to probably the very end of the 1970s and early 1980s, and uh, I won't attempt to survey the history. There's some brief survey, for instance, in uh, my paper, uh, my old paper on hyperbolicity of renormalization of critical circle maps if you're interested. Um, I want to talk about renormalization itself. So, you see, uh, before I talk about conceptual difficulty, it's, it's, it's a good idea to say uh, what we actually want from this. Well, we always want the same thing from renormalization. We want to say something like this. Okay, renormalization is an operator. So what we want? We want to say that R, so we want R to be an operator. Wait, let me squeeze in the word smooth operator in a manifold. And then let's say if you fix your rotation number, make it something nice. Let's say we take the golden mean, the inverse golden mean square root of 5 minus 1 over 2, that's a continued fraction of all 1's. Then there is a fixed point for your operator, and this fixed point is hyperbolic. So here is the picture that you saw several times in the talk. Uh, that's the renormalization fixed point. That's the local stable manifold. That's the local unstable manifold. The dimension of the local stable manifold this one this is a hyperbolic fixed point so this is the ultimate goal okay now the difficulty is the following well uh, what set and are we going to define our operator R in we could try to consider the space of commutant pair of a finite smoothness. C3 or more generally CK or some um, K at least 3. The, this space can be easily endowed with the structure of a Banach manifold. It is obviously preserved by R. I mean, after all, renormalization really just involves compositions plus a fine rescaling. So you start with C3 maps, you end with C3 maps. The problem that you are going to have, and that's an elementary exercise for those who have never seen it before, is that composition, the operator of composition, is not smooth from CK cross CK to CK. It is smooth from CK cross CK to CK minus 1. And that is not good because then your operator R is not differentiable in the space where you would like it to would like to consider it. Right? So you have to look at things of infinite smoothness. Uh, let me not even mention C infinity because it's horrible. It doesn't have any reasonable structure to work with, and let me talk about analytic methods. So we could consider commutant pairs in the analytic category. And here the difficulty is, is happens rather early. You see this very mild commutation condition, which is heartless in C3 or CK category, is uh, really uh, a big deal if your maps are analytic. 
And if they're analytic, they have canonical analytic continuations in a neighborhood of zero, which either I commute or don't. It's not a finite codimension condition in C omega cross C omega, and um, I don't know how to make it work, at least not directly. So that's the, that's the conceptual difficulty, which uh, made me introduce cylinder renormalization at some point. So this is something that Misha has already discussed, but let me still mention the construction because it's, it's quick and easy. So to define cylinder renormalization, now we're working in the analytic head, right? So now my maps are analytic. To define cylinder renormalization, I consider, a, well, I require my maps to have a little bit more structure. And this structure is the full one. I want the map to have a fixed point for the iterate that's going to glue the two sides of the interval for some reason which is beyond me. Here I switch to calling it QM rather than QN. I hope you can forgive me. And uh, right, so this is the iterate that we use to glue the two sides of the interval together. But now I also want this to have a fixed point outside of the circle that is above in this picture. By symmetry, uh, this will have a symmetric one below. And I want to be able to connect them with a curve in such a way that its image is disjoint from the curve except at the endpoints. All right, so then if I can do that, then my gluon can be defined not only on the interval, but also in the complex plane. I could take this fundamental domain, and I can glue the sides using the same iterate. It's the same gluon on the interval, the same exact thing which led us into trouble before. But now it's defined in this um, whole domain. Now this domain is topologically uh, well, okay, so what you get, I mean, this is, this is an analytic blue, and you, you're going to get a Riemann surface. This Riemann surface is topologically a cylinder. By symmetry, it's either a bi-infinite cylinder or a bi-finite cylinder. Just by doing, and it's, you know, just by choosing your curve, well, locally, you can be sure that this, this is a bi-infinite cylinder so that this will be conformal isomorphic to C mod Z. And now a miracle happens. Uh, C mod Z as a Riemann surface does not have any non-affine conformal automorphisms. That's a version of Liouville's theorem. And therefore, we recover the canonical affine structure, which was lost when we're just looking on the interval. So now we have a canonical affine structure. I, I can just get it if I uniformize this, this Riemann surface. This gives me C mod Z. That contains R mod Z, which is the equator in this, in this picture. Just, uh, and the first return map to the equator is an analytic map of the circle, of, of an actual honest circle. So this is what I call cylinder renormalization. And this is fine. This is an analytic operator in the Banach manifold. And the Banach manifold is just Banach manifold of analytic maps defined on some fixed annulus um, around the circle. So with this, uh, is, is what? It clear that you can renormalize your fixed cylinder has not so uh, it is, how should I put it? It's, it is beyond unclear. It is a major piece of the theory to show exactly this. So this is a consequence of complex a priori bounds, um, which is uh, the main analytic step in proving the renormalization picture. But it is a true statement. So the true statement is that you can choose and annulus, which is in fact the same annulus for all um, 
interpretation of this, such that this will actually be an operator in the body of Okay, well, perhaps instead of taking the first renormalization, you have to take the fifth renormalization, but then it will really bring you back to the same exact thing. Okay, so with this in mind, let me just say that one can prove hyperbolicity free normalization. Exactly that picture that I have on the right show that there is, in particular, if, if you fix your rotation number to the golden mean, then you have uh, a fixed point in the space of pairs, blah, 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 and this fixed point is hyperbolic. Now, of course, as Michel already mentioned, this uh, Immediately clear that the same construction also works for the Siegel disks. Uh, the only difference will be you lose the real symmetry. Now, one of the fixed points is the center of the Siegel disk, and the other one is outside, and you still do the same construction. You uniformize here, it's convenient to keep on uniformizing to get C star, so that you put this N of the cylinder at the origin again. And then this R will become your new single disk. You will get your cylinder in your And in fact, for, for high type, using results of Eno and Shishakura, uh, I could show hyperbolicity. And for, for um, other types, there was a partial result um, that Michel already described. Now, the thing is, for the rest of the talk, I'll have to regress a bit, in fact. The reason I have to regress is the following. The questions that, that I would like to apply renormalization in this setting and also in the Siegel setting are questions in not in one dimension but in two dimension. I would like to apply this to two dimensional dissipative maps. Okay, so for instance, we can consider the family of complex quadratic henomets. So this will be very dissipative. My Jacobian will be small, so uh, you should think of this as a very small perturbation of the quadratic polynomial, which is what you'll get if you put your a equal to zero here. By definition, the fixed point of, of this map is called semi-Siegel if one of its eigenvalues lies on the unit circle. Well, the other one, of course, has to be very small. And uh, moreover, this map is linearizable, analytically linearizable, in the neighborhood. Now, It's a classical result of Siegel, but you can do it uh, for the affected rotation numbers. Of course, you can do it for Bruno numbers. But the thing is, that's a local construction. Linearization is a local construction. But for uh, an all, you could do a global construction, just like you do a global construction for um, rational numbers. And there is a maximum linearization neighbor. So there is a maximal biholomorphic map, maximal in the sense that its image is maximal. Such that, well, this map conjugates your uh, polynomial automorphism to uh, the linear map, which is multiplied by lambda in the first coordinate, that is a rotation and multiplies by mu in the second coordinate, which is a contraction. So, um, the image of the unit disk cross C will be your maximal linearization domain, and it's a cylinder. And inside the cylinder, you have the attractor which is, of course, the slice phi of d cross 0. That is a biomorphically embedded disk, which is what 
I like to call the single disk. So one motivated question that I'd like to ask, which is probably uh, in all likelihood it's due to Michelle Armand, is the question about the structure of the boundary of this. Just like you do in one dimension, you can ask in two dimensions whether this is a topological circle. Actually, I should have prepared this slide, and I didn't because I didn't know how much time I would have, but I think I have enough time. This was not the motivating question that uh, of this uh, whole thing. The motivating question was a little bit more modern. It was asked by Enrique Pujols, this question is due to Pujols. And he asked it only a couple of years ago. And this question, rather than with uh, dealing with single disk, deals with the real symmetric situation. So the analog of small per well, not the analog. Here we're talking about small perturbations of um, quadratic polynomials with single disk. The other question deals with small perturbations of um, Critical circle maps. So you have, in, in the very general setting, if you like, you have a standard annulus, A, and you have a real analytic map of the annulus to itself. You define lambda, the attractor, in quotes, to be the intersection of the forward images of the annulus. And you would like to know if under some general conditions, if your thing is a small perturbation, very dissipative small perturbation of a critical circle map, you could say that the attractor is a circle, right? So you, you would like to ask whether lambda is a circle. You could ask, of course, I mean, if you have a situation of normal hyperbolicity, then, then you're guaranteed that lambda will be a circle and it will be smooth. And that's essentially an equivalent state. But you want to talk about small perturbations of critical circle maps. So for instance, you could take, you could do this for the Arnold family. So this was the specific question that Enrique asked. You could look at the two parameter Arnold family. So here, I just want to be consistent with my notes. So let's say we take F A theta of X, which is X minus A over T pi <coughs> sine by x plus theta. This is just like the Arnold maps that I looked at previously, except my a now, um, uh, sorry, my one now is a parameter a. Right? If a is less than one, then you're going to get a diffib. If a is equal to one, you're going to get a critical circle map. And now you, you build uh, an, a non family out of this, right? So you take F A theta X plus B Y in the first coordinate and second coordinate I have to put something which is one periodic in X because I have to project this to the cylinder. I don't know, it doesn't really really matter so much, but you could take B for instance F A theta of X minus X. This is one period. Now Let's pretend that if you fix the rotation number, so my rho is the inverse of the mean, let's pretend that you get a smooth submanifold in the manifold in the three-dimensional manifold of such maps. And there is no reason why that should be true, but just pretend it is. Okay, so you, you have a two-parameter um, family if you have this restriction. Let's say this would be my a axis and this is my b axis. When b is equal to zero and a is equal to one, that's your critical circle map. Okay. Here, you have a diffium. And then the question that Enrique asked was whether there is a curve here on which you have a critical circle attractor. Let me explain. I mean, in here, you would have a smooth circle attractor. 
this is your normally hyperbolic situation. And this would be the boundary. Here your attractor lambda would be a circle, but it would not be smooth. Just like we normally expect for nice rotation numbers, the boundaries of Siegel disks to be circles, but not smooth. So that's the two motivating questions. Okay, they're both two-dimensional. And now here comes the, the, the problem. You see in this definition of <coughs> cylinder renormalization, <coughs> to construct this renormalization, to do this rescaling and recover a critical circle map, we use a one-dimensional complex analytic magic uniformization of Riemann surfaces. There is structure here which is hard to translate into 2D. At least, I'm not, I don't want to claim that something is impossible, but it was impossible for me. And, uh, and if you think back to uh, Misha Lubitsch's talk, uh, and their beautiful theory of Pac-Man. There, there is even more one-dimensional magic, even more structure than just the uniformization. Now, of course, I haven't explained to you why these questions, I mean, this question and the question on the other board are renormalization type question, questions the experts know, and everybody else, I'll, I hope to explain it to you in a few minutes. But if you believe for a second that they are, then we are after extended renormalization to two-dimensional maps, which have no nice structure a priori. So my definition it has to be general enough. I mean, in this setting, in uh, the setting um, of Enrique's question, I, I just want to have some really some, some uh, uh, locally defined real analytic maps, which are small enough perturbations of uh, critical circle maps. There, there is no structure really to talk about. Um, and even in this case, and my family has to be big enough to trap renormalizations of maps in, the, in a dissipative and all family. So instead of taking a step forward, we have to take a step back. Now I'm saying we because all the results that um, I'm going to talk about are joined with Dennis Gaidesha from Uppsala. So look, I mean, I already showed you the answer, but let me let me just refresh the the the, uh, the difficulty. I mean, why why were we forced to do all of this? nonsense? Well, we're forced to do, to do this nonsense because of the following problem. If we look at the maps of finite smoothness, then uh, our computation condition is nothing. Uh, it's not hard to prove that you will get a bonnet manifold. Renormalization preserves this manifold, but it's, the operator is not smooth. So you cannot talk about its differential. Whereas if you look at C omega cross C omega, well, <laughs> Then, uh, uh, then, it, then it's worse. I mean, the composition, of course, it's smooth. It's even analytic. But uh, the combination condition doesn't give you a bond of many. Right? So the uh, solution is, is elementary, as usual. Um, the definition is, we say that a pair is almost commutative. If the following two things are true, uh, the maps of the pair are real analytic, but it only forms a C3 commuting pair. That is, these real analytic maps have C3 smooth extensions to some neighborhoods of the intervals of the definition, not their canonical analytic continuations, which turn them into commuting maps. There's an equivalent way of formulating this for critical circle maps. 
this would mean that eta composed with psi minus psi composed with eta at zero is O small of x cubed. So the, the commutator vanishes to order three. Now in the single disk case, the corresponding condition is that they vanish to order two. You should think of these maps as having a cubic critical point, hence order three, and these maps have a quadratic critical point, hence order two. And these, this is the setting in which we consider renormalization. So it's a step back, right? I mean, my space is now even larger than the space of commuting pairs. This is essentially a square of the space of analytic interval maps. So no structure whatsoever. On the other hand, minimalization is, of course, well, first of all, it's a Banach medical. Right? It's easy to show. Uh, I mean, it's quite believable. Right? C3 commutation is a finite co-dimension condition. And it's easy to show that in fact, for any k greater than or equal to 3, you will have a Banach submanifold. Minimalization obviously preserves it because it preserves both pairs of analytic maps and C3 commuting pairs. So, of course, I was ecstatically happy when we came up with this, and then uh, certainly when you think that you've invented something, you go and look at the literature, and this has been used. But at least I can be excused for not knowing this because it, it's been used before I was born. <laughs> it was <laughs> used in the 1980s in the proofs of the computer assisted proofs of the existence of renormalization fixed points. So in the <laughs> what? Hold on. Feeling a little insecure there? Yes, I really am that young. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, so this was done. This was done in the context of critical circle maps by Mestel, and then the Siegel this case by Sternemann and uh, Burbanks. I believe Sternemann was the advisor, and Burbanks was the student. So now theorems. So in both um, contexts, we want to prove the same theorem. It's this, where is this? This beautiful picture. Not this one, not this one, this one. So we want to prove renormalization hyperbolicity state. So for um, critical circle maps, we actually prove this theorem in the full generality independently of the rotation number, we construct a full renormalization horseshoe. In the, yeah, and um, it's not quite as easy as it was for critical circle maps. This is a much larger space, so some things become technically difficult in this context. For instance, it's, it's somewhat harder to construct the unstable cone for um, pairs than for analytic maps of the circle. Um, for Siegel disk, we only have this statement for this specific rotation number, because the proof is computer assisted. Remember, a large portion of the picture, if, if you listen to uh, Misha's talk, the large portion of the picture, a large portion of the picture for Siegel disks already existed. We know, we know that the operator is um, analytic, compact, therefore there is a spectral decomposition. We know it has at least one unstable direction. What, what we need to know is that the core dimension of the stable manifold is exactly one. Okay, so that's something we prove with the use of computer for this specific rotation number. And then, of course, that's what we wanted to do. What we wanted to do is we wanted to extend renormalization to two-dimensional dissipative maps. Okay, I'm going to lie, and I'm going to tell you that you can extend this definition directly. 
So, in other words, where is it? With, uh, and this will be a very believable one. Because what is your renormalization here? You take eta psi and you replace it by psi, comma, eta composed with psi to the r, linearly rescaled. Okay? This recipe can be repeated for two dimensional maps verbatim. No fancy schmancy uniformization coordinates, nothing like this. This is not quite what. What kind of domain do you have there? So, um, what we have there are polydisks. Polydisks? Yes. So, no, no instant anyway. Well, there are no anyway anymore because. Uh, well, There could be, but no. We we use we use very thin polydisks. Very what? Thin. Thin polydisks. Okay. So really a small neighborhood of a one dimension the one dimensional picture. So that's not quite what we do. Instead we do um, something in the spirit of the work of uh, De Carvalho, Lubitsch, and Martens for dissipative and no maps in the period Dublin case. So there, is, there still is a clever change of coordinates that helps us uh, extend the theory to the two-dimensional. So, uh, and then, well, and then we have the same picture. I mean, these are dissipative maps. When you uh, compose and renormalize, they become even better. This uh, fixed point is the same one-dimensional fixed point. And because of the clever change of coordinates, the spectrum of the two-dimensional renormalization is the same as the one-dimensional renormalization fact. Uh, we can be more specific and we can say that all the two-dimensional perturbations correspond to the zero eigenvalue in the spectrum. So it's the same exact picture, the 2D maps as the picture for the 1D maps. So in the remaining what, seven minutes, I want to uh, give you applications. And uh, well, there are two settings, and let me talk about Siegel disks because uh, um, this is a theorem with uh, Dennis and also with, with Remus Rado, who is present here. And it says, well, it gives, it gives a positive answer to the question in the case when the map is sufficiently dissipative and the rotation number is the golden mean. So we prove that for sufficiently dissipative quadratic complex in all with a semi segal point whose rotation number is e to the 2 pi i theta star, where a theta star is what I call raw here for some reason. The um, Siegel disk is bound by the topological circle. And moreover, the Conjugacy with rotation on this boundary is not smooth. Now, why would you ever think it would be smooth? I expect this boundary to be fractal. Hey, I expect that too. I'm not saying that I would think it to be smooth. I'm just saying good stuff. I mean, we think right. <laughs> <laughs> but we do know that boundaries of single disk can be smooth, even for quadratic polynomials. So it is reassuring that, you know. Not with the rotation number. Not with the rotation number of the golden mean. I'm, hey, I'm completely with you here. I'm saying it's, it's a theorem. Okay. And the thing is that we also, this is the. So I would like to uh, also mention that. But Dennis will also prove the picture that Enrique won. And again, I mean here this is a critical circle, so the conjugacy is not smooth.
smooth. Now, how does this come about? Well, there is a meta theorem here, which is the same in both contexts. And this meta theorem says the following. Suppose you have a map which is in the stable manifold of the renormalization fixed point in both contexts, both real symmetric and non-real symmetric. So a two-dimensional map which happens to live in the stable manifold. So its renormalizations converge to the fixed point. Well, geometrically fast. Then the boundary is a topological circle. So once we show that, then all that remains to show is that this family actually intersects the stable manifold. And that's part of the reason why it was important to have a large space of two-dimensional maps on which we define renormalization. Once we know that it intersects it, uh, well, at the point where it intersects, we will have um, a Siegel that's bounded by a topological circle, and then we can just read off the rotation number from the um, renormalization, because the digits of the continued fraction can be read off from your first return maps. And that tells you that it is the golden mean. Okay? And that is how 1 plus 2 imply our main result. Now, let me mention, oh, I don't have to walk, I can just push. Nice. Right. So the proof that this family intersects um, the stable manifold follows from the fact um, that was missing in um, the renormalization picture. That is that the co-dimension of this manifold is 1. Right? Then you have the quadratic family, which crosses it transversely. And you're in no family if your uh, mu is small enough, is uh, a small C1 perturbation. So, um, and that's, you know, in a nutshell, that's a proof. Modular details, um, many details. For instance, the hyper hyperbolicity picture for uh, quadratic polynomials is obtained in the context of cylinder normalization. Here we're working with pairs, but you can relate one to the other sufficiently well to be able to prove this part of the picture. So, um, <coughs> let me mention something else. I mean. You should be wondering why I even showed you these slides with cylinder renormalization. Well, first of all, because it could. But there's another reason. There is a different um, direction, I mean different different new result in a rather different direction, which is also a generalization of the existing theory of critical circle maps. And that is Oh, wait, I haven't told you the main thing. Can I, can I, could you excuse me? I, let me, let, let's just strike everything I said in the last 30 seconds. It's, it's, I think they put some vodka in this order. My apologies. The, right. Um, I haven't told you how, how to prove theorem, uh, how to prove the statement one. I told you how to prove the statement two. But statement one, um, I mean, yeah, I, and here as well, I mean, what is the connection between this uh, wonderful renormalization picture and this whole business with uh, attractors being critical circles in, in these two contexts? This is actually easy to see, I mean, just one slide. Uh, here's a proof by picture. Let's do Siegel this, just because the picture is not real symmetric. It, it doesn't matter, it's the, the same example. So, Let's say something lies in the um, strong stable manifold of the of the renormalization fixed point, right? So, in particular, renormalizations are defined for this thing indefinitely. I can renormalize once, twice, three times, ten times, as many as I like. Well, my renormalizations are defined in polydisks. It's hard to draw a polydisk, but it's a very thin polydisk. So we'll just draw a one-dimensional projection of this polydisk, a complex one-dimensional. 
So here is, it's a pair, right? So there's a polydisc on one side and a polydisc on the other side. And they overlap, and the overlap should contain the origin somewhere, which loses all importance in 2D, and you can't say that it's a critical point of anything, just saying that this is a small perturbation of a one-dimensional picture, so it's there. And then you can renormalize it. You can, well, if you renormalize it once, it's not very interesting because one of the polydisks stays the same. Let's renormalize it a few times. Okay, what does that mean? Well, there is a linearly rescaled copy of these two, somewhere here. And then, how do you renormalize? Well, you have to consider the first return map of each of these by your original maps. So this goes somewhere here, then here, 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 there, 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 and the tiles, uh, some sort of a chain of domains, right? And and you can renormalize so none of these domains sticks out of your original picture. But then you can iterate. You can do the same thing at the next level. I should have done this at one more level, but I'm lazy, so I didn't. Um, so you should just imagine that this chain is also, a copy of this chain is also contained in each of these pieces, and so on. And then when you take the intersection, you get this red curve, which is going to be a part of the boundary of your Siegel disk. And how do you know that this is a curve, that is that points are points? You know that points are points because you know that sizes of these pieces shrink. In fact, they shrink geometrically fast with the level, just because this is a small perturbation of one-dimensional renormalization. In fact, it gets closer and closer to the one-dimensional case the more you renormalize. And that's how you do the proof in both settings. Okay? Just in one setting, we have the, the proof for all rotation numbers, so we get this picture, say, for all bounded type. And uh, in the other setting, we only do this for the inverse golden mean, so we have this picture for the inverse golden mean. Um, so in fact, um, with um, John Gok Yang, we actually showed the slightly stronger statement here, that not only the conjugacy is not smooth, but Hamel will be happy to hear this, but the boundary is not smooth either. Right? So it is, it is actually a fractal, which is a good thing. So that, that is the, the two-dimensional part of the talk. And now let me just mention this result, uh, another new result, in a rather different vein, but in the same general topic. And this is an application of the cylinder renormalization, which is somehow lost and forgotten in the last few minutes. Uh, and this is joined with Igor Garbovitskis, who is also present here, also from Uppsala. And here we consider a somewhat different um, open problem. We'll look at renormalization of maps with non-integer critical exponent. So you see maps which have a singularity of the form which looks like absolute value of x to the alpha minus 1 times x, where your alpha is some number bigger than 1. These maps, unless alpha is an odd integer, cannot be analytically continued to, to a neighborhood of 0. However, it has been well known Experimentally, they also give you nice universality, so you still expect to have a hyperbolic renormalization picture. The difficulty, well, one of the difficulties, perhaps one of the main difficulties here, is how do you extend this analytic machinery of renormalization? How do you extend the definition to these maps? And it is here that, that cylinder renormalization uh, turns out to be very, very well suited because you see, you're in trouble at this point. But you're gluing away from this point. So in fact, this definition, in the appropriate way, can be translated to maps with non-analytic uh, critical exponent. So by doing this, we extend that. Um, our definition of the renormalization operator to um, maps with non-odd integer alpha. And, and 
of course, the, the operator is really not one operator, but a continuous, in fact, smooth family of operators, one for each alpha. And therefore, you could uh, extend renormalization hyperbolicity um, more or less just by continuity. And so we obtain renormalization hyperbolicity here for all alpha which are sufficiently close to all integers. What ordered integers. Okay, so I think, oh, it's perfect. I think that's exactly one hour. And uh, I'm sorry, my, my slides were really not not high tech, but I do have, and I'm just, I'm just not good with technology. And so, but I do have one, one high tech slide just to remind us both of the festive occasion and of the fact that the cocktail reception is expecting those who survived my lecture. <laughs> so thank you very much. Anticipation is no, but we don't know yet. 